You're now listening to The Brian Callen Show with your host, Brian Callen. Ladies and gentlemen, today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. I have been an Audible member for, well, as long as I can remember, children. <laughs> I, that's how I get all my books read, which is actually true. Let me go through a list of books I have on my, I have one, two, give and take, learn to eat soup with a knife, excellent sheep, a fiasco, why nations fail, mindset, Beautiful Ruins, the screw tape letters. Man, it goes on and on. I, I literally, I drive, and that's how, that's why when people go, Brian, you're so smart. Not only are you athletic and good looking, but you're incredibly smart. You must have a huge brain. I say, nay, it's just audible, you guys. <laughs> Audiblepodcast.com slash BCS for a free audio download. Uh, the, this company is actually doing a real service. They got over 180,000 titles to choose from. So once again, it's audiblepodcast.com slash BCS, and there you have it. Um, you can get everything, magazines, newspapers, the whole thing. It's ridiculous. So if you don't have time to read and you're in your car, listen. Immerse yourself in the best that's been thought and said. Speaking of which, <laughs> speaking of the best that's been thought and said, David Sloan Wilson, Professor David Sloan Wilson, is on the phone Um my my, I want to start by by saying this, Professor. Um, I, I let me let me just start with an anecdote. I was I like to do a little boxing and jujitsu, and uh, and I was a wrestler. And I went to San Francisco and I and I got to do a little jujitsu with a guy named Jake Shields. And you don't know him, Professor, but he is he was at one point one of the top fighters in the world, one of the top cage fighters, MMA fighters and a master on the ground at jiu-jitsu. And when I say I got to roll around with him and try to best him in a fight, uh, uh, what I mean is that he did whatever he wanted to me. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and basically in three minutes, I realized that he could have killed me with his bare hands uh, anytime he wanted to. That experience of getting literally flattened and totally outclassed, I'm, I'm making a larger point here, is a little bit how I feel when I read <laughs> your work and I think to myself, <laughs> th there, are, there are people who are smart and then there's me. It's a, just a different kind of thing. I do the best I can to read and sort of think and then I, I realize that there are people like you who write original work and tackle huge questions, huge questions, and that is the title of your book, Does Altruism Exist? And you do a masterful job, sir. Uh, of well, that's high praise. Too bad I'm a flabby white guy. and I couldn't, <laughs> last, couldn't last one nanosecond in a cage. So I'll, I guess I'll have to make use with my wits and not my, not my body. That's more important, man. The point is I could beat you. I could probably beat you in a fight, but not if it came to brain, a brain against brain. So. Well, you underestimate yourself. You know, I mean, your readers should know that we do a lot of talking. This isn't the first time we've been talking. This is true. And so, uh, and so um, I really look forward to sharing some of the thoughts. But uh, you underestimate yourself yourself uh, um, in mind games, uh, probably also in the cage. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, let's talk, let's talk, let's start this way. Um, you talk about the word altruism. It doesn't, I was fascinated to see that it doesn't, it's not a word that has always been around. It's not a word you can find. It's not an ancient word, or at least the concept isn't necessarily uh, an ancient concept. I might be wrong about that, but I think that's what I gathered from what you were talking about. Uh, can that's you right. Can, yeah. uh, it was invented in the 1800s by uh, a philosopher named Auguste Comte, hmm. and uh, he wanted to create a religion of humanity, uh, a religion that had nothing to do with God. And uh, altruism was a way for him to claim the moral high ground, basically, because religion, as strange as it might seem, although it gets you to be altruistic in terms of how you behave, that's not how it frames it. It frames it like, you know, you'll go to heaven if you're, if you're nice to others, which isn't really very altruistic psychologically. So that's one of the you know, really interesting um, insights in the, in the concept of altruism that I'm able to report in my book. Yeah, you, you, I mean, you hear this all the time. People say, well, there is no such thing as true altruism because everybody does, ultimately, they do things to their own end. Even if it's sacrifice, you know, it's for their legacy, for their children, for their name to live on. At the end of the day, it's always about us. And you define altruism, or at least it is defined as someone who does something for the greater good, uh, regardless of whether or not it it benefits the individual doing the act. I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. 
you um, make a very good argument and case study for the fact that whether or not it exists, altruistic behavior uh, from an evolutionary perspective is ultimately the way to go. Uh, um, you, you, fascinating where you talk about altruistic behavior, selfish behavior works within a group. You might get most of the girls and most of the money, for example, if you behave in a very aggressive, selfish way. But selfish groups never beat altruistic groups. They don't that's have as a, many. It's that, it's that simple. So let me just play that back. <clears throat> Number one, the idea that altruism does not exist, that everything is somehow selfish, that has a long tradition, and it's very familiar in everyday thought. Number two, evolutionists seem to contribute to that notion, that somehow uh, evolution explains selfishness well and cannot explain anything that we could call uh, genuine altruism. Number three, Au contraire, evolution actually can explain altruism at face value in more or less the way that you've described, that if I were to ask anyone to describe the morally perfect individual, they'd give a whole list of adjectives, loving, unselfish, brave, honorable, and all of that. And uh, the opposite, of course, would be selfish, murderous, deceitful, and all of that. And that if you lock these different types of individuals in a Darwinian contest, you know, like in a cage of sorts, then, um, then you know, who wins? Well, within a cage, uh, the selfish type wins, but if you have a bunch of cages, then uh, we can get altruistic groups beating selfish groups. And so actually we have the means to explain uh, how altruism, as anyone would define it, can evolve by a Darwinian process, but of course it doesn't always Evolve, and so we have a kind of a contest between between good and evil playing itself out on a Darwinian stage in much the same way that it often plays itself out on a on a, a religious stage and as simple as all that is it 's really a new foundation, a new kind of a new paradigm for thinking about uh, altruism that can help us think about altruism as it has by philosophers throughout the ages. How did you how did you arrive at this conclusion? Was there a eureka moment? Was it from studying bees, from or studying rapey animals? Rapey water striders. Yeah. Yeah, uh, rapey water striders. Yeah. Or, uh, you, you, gotta, you guys have to read the book. It's some of the some of the things, the case studies on the biology <laughs> of, of of how insects, how bees cooperate. It's just fascinating, man. So what was the what was the moment where you kind of decided to buck against tradition here? Well, it wasn't a moment, and uh, one of the things I recount is that this is one of these controversies that, that, that is extremely protracted, and we know about other controversies like this. You know, this, like the uh, sun being the center of the solar system, the question of whether continents drift. Now, these are, are controversies that, for some reason, take many decades to play themselves out, even though at the end of the day you look back and you say, what took so long? How did smart people take so long to reach what seems to us like an obvious conclusion? So I claim somewhat controversially that we've reached that point uh, now, and so I can actually report on this controversy as if it's over. And that, uh, but it is, <clears throat> excuse me, it has taken place over a period of many decades, such that when I entered the field, now 40 years ago, <laughs> um, uh, group selection was more or less totally rejected and has taken all this time to reach the commonsensical uh, conclusion that you were able to report in plain English uh, in, uh, in just a minute. Uh, it's that... Um, it's that amazing, just like those other controversies. But That's how we can start to think about altruism. When you speak about it take, taking smart people a long time to reach a conclusion, I was thinking about slavery. And I was thinking about how, <laughs> how it was the order of the day for millennia uh, among everyone. My God, even, even our founding fathers. And to now, now, if you if anybody who would seriously advocate not only not only slaves, but it, can you imagine if somebody had slaves? I, I, are you kidding me? But that was the order of the day, and the idea of a worldwide abolitionist movement was thought to be complete a fantasy, a fantasy. You're not going to get rid of slavery, but somehow, I would argue that the entire world, with the exception of probably some small pockets, knows. That that is 
just one of the great evils. Human bondage is one of the great evils. Um, anyway, well, you I'm, know, I say I have a lot of things to say about that, and let me knock just a few off. One is, you know, you're right. This was something that was morally normative and then became sinful. That's one point to make. Number two, it still exists, as sinful as we might think of it. Mm. And number two, there's also a form of economic bondage that's, uh, that's, uh, that's regarded as normative uh, by many people, is that you can have economic systems, which basically put most people in a kind of an economic slavery. Mm. Uh, so, and that could, change, that could change, too. So one, one point to make here is that uh, you know, when people think about altruism, they think about behaviors that are, benefit others at some huge cost to, to uh, oneself. But uh, the book and, and altruism in general is really about much more than that. It's about how groups work and how large societies work, how they can work like an organism, which is, you know, very harmoniously, or how they can break down and, uh, and really benefit just some people and not others within the society. So the scope of the book is huge, and it has much to do with, and morality has much to do, not just with do unto others and, and you know, be nice to others even when it costs yourself, but morality equally has to do with with norms of accepted behavior enforced by punishment. There's a coercive element to morality. And what counts as moral and what counts as immoral is something that can change, as it has for slavery and as it can for economic bondage. And I think, you know, it's just helpful so that, that people can really play out this, this controversy and understand it to talk about the rapey water striders. Could you talk to us about how they're, so water striders are those little creatures that float around on the surface of the water, um, and they apparently come in two different flavors, rapey and gentleman. Um, yeah. <laughs> one, one, one just rapes uh, whoever he comes across, and the other ones actually court the females. Yeah, talk about what you found there. It's fascinating. Yeah, and this is the, my grad student, uh, Omar Eldakar, who did this work. It was very uh, uh, creative work. He's been well recognized for it. But it's more or less as you describe it. Of course, we could resonate this with, 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 um, with, uh, with humans. The general rule here is that selfishness beats altruism within groups and altruistic groups beat selfish groups. And the water striders provide a really cool example in which some males are just sexual predators. If you were to t think about them in human terms, they would be rapists. And in fact, this has been going on for so long that the genitals, the penis of the water strider, is like a weapon. It's, it's designed to pry itself into the female, and then there's a spiny balloon that gets inflated so that the female cannot escape once she's been penetrated. Doesn't that sound like fun? Yeah, it sounds like so, a blast. Gee whiz. <laughs> God. I mean, nature has stories like that, but it turns out that, that um, uh, male water striders vary from, what, from some that are extremely aggressive to some that are extremely docile and basically wait to be asked to perform their manly duty. Mm. And what uh, Omar did, very simply... He, was, he, he created groups of water striders, six males, six females, and he altered the composition of the males from all psychopaths to all gentlemen, and what he found, and plus mixes in between. And what he found was in any group containing both types, the psychopaths cleaned up, basically. Mm. So if that was the only thing taking place, then there would be no docile males. But on the other hand, because of the harassment, the females in the pools with the, uh, with the rapists, well, they couldn't eat. <laughs> they mm. couldn't do anything except try to escape the males. Mm. Therefore, they laid very few eggs. And so the groups with the docile males were much more productive than the groups with the um, aggressive males. And based on these opposing forces, one force within groups favoring uh, the rapey males, uh, is rapey going to become a word now? I think I, it's got to. It's got to. <laughs> I, was, I was actually thinking that the female water striders that are being raped are in one of Dante's rings. There's got to be, like this example of hell on earth, you know. Yeah. Run away from the there's also spun, that spiny dick. Uh, there, you know? There's also got to be some sort of t-shirt or meme around the rapey water strider. Yeah. We'll, see, uh, we'll see if that happens. But, uh, so an important message is, you know, there's good news and bad news. The good news is, is that, you know, the good guys can win. The bad news is, is that special conditions are required, and in this case, we get a mix of good news and bad news. We get the good guys persisting in the population, but the bad guys are also hanging on, 
And if that doesn't sound like human life, what does? Yeah. And isn't, I think that's what's also interesting. Brian and I were talking about this in the context of uh, Pinker's book, The Better Angels of Our Nature. Yeah. You know, isn't isn't it, it seems like human society is being structured and ordered in a way over the last 100,000 years that really gives advantage to the good guys. Uh, there's, I mean, it's always like two steps forward, one step back. There's, there's nothing like, you know, just inevitable progress right. in evolution. And so if you want to look at long-term trends, which is the subject of Pinker's book, then yes, actually, it's kind of surprising. Even though at every moment we like to think that things are going, getting worse, in fact, they've been getting better. And, we, and it's a much safer world for, for us now than for our... Um, uh, predecessors. But of course, that's very heterogeneous, and things can collapse, so it can definitely go the other way. But you could make the argument that countries that are more altruistic, at least countries that give more, um, are, are, are have a better human rights record among their populace, have freer populations, always seem to do better and are even more powerful than, especially in the long run, than dictatorships, uh, fiefdoms, etc. Well, it's more, it's more complex that way. There is an element of truth to what you're saying in the book that you've already mentioned that's on your Audible, uh, Why Nations Fail. Mm, exactly. Is, uh, that's exactly its thesis. And what that book shows is that among developed nations, or among a large set of nations, then it is indeed the case that the ones that are more inclusive do better as nations than the ones that are more extractive. And the reason, for example, that the Industrial Revolution started in primarily in England was because it was more a more inclusive uh, a nation. So that's a really uh, interesting. On the other hand, there's also a lot of research that shows if you have really, like, uh, just chaos, it's called existential insecurity, the kind of thing that takes place in the Middle East. At that point, fundamentalist religions and fundamentalist cultures like ISIS um, are the ones that are actually strongest in that situation. And of course, that's exactly what we see, that in the really chaotic regions of the earth, you don't get egalitarian societies. You get very hierarchical societies and authoritarian societies that nevertheless have the way of, of creating extreme solidarity under conditions in which cultures are in great danger of going extinct. And that's why you can go to Europe and only five or six centuries ago, and you'll see the kind of acts which strike us as so incomprehensibly cruel. Torture and things. Yeah. Torture and beheadings and things like that. Um, and And cultures in which you cannot be out of step. You can't just do what you want. There'll be the, the, the cruelest of mechanisms to keep you in line. Well, that describes Europe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's Are right. They, you know, and we really have to be good historians. So part of this is my, my colleague, Peter Turchin, who you definitely need to have on this show, um, he's studying history from this multi-level cultural evolutionary uh, perspective. So, and it so much depends on on the environment, that it can go back and forth. We're lucky that it's progressed in the way that it has, but it's up to us to keep it going that way because it can collapse, and in some ways, you know, I mean, it has collapsed. That's not just hypothetical, and it can in the, um, in the future. One thing Peter has done is a detailed history of the United States showing cycles, basically, that... The United States, is, in the past, it has been the most egalitarian of nations. Now it is leading the world, the developed world, in, in, uh, in inequality. And as it goes back and forth, then the quality of life goes in inverse step. And you can just see it on the page when you, when you, uh, when you uh, look at the uh, uh, data. But, of course, we're living it. I can and just that, I can just see a bunch of Republicans kind of <laughs> I can see their backs straightening up right now. I can just say, hey, Sloan Wilson is starting to get kind of subversive here. What the hell is he talking about? <laughs> Why'd you use that word egalitarian, you goddamn socialist? You know. Well, I think it's actually it's not subversive. It's just it. An important point to make is that it does not fit into any current ideological category, and that's what's so exciting about it. It really deserves to be a new uh, paradigm that does away with the old. 
categories. It's not as if this slots into liberalism or socialism. No, it, it's, it's, your argument is that it's biology, isn't it? Your argument is that there is a there is a scientific and biological and evolutionary sort of, uh, uh, I, I suppose, metric for this, um, and meaning that if we are moving in the direction we are currently moving in, that is ultimately not the way to evolve because it's not going to benefit us in the long run, any of us in the long run as a country. And more generally, we need to base our, our economic theories, our political, social theories on, in the first place, complexity, because these are very, very complex systems. They're often out of equilibrium. And in the second place, evolution. These are the theoretical foundations. And if you look at the alternatives, especially mainstream economic theory, uh, which is so dominant and is so entrenched and is so unwilling to yield the stage. And if you look at its theoretical foundations, I mean, the emperor truly has no clothes. There is a grotesque, naked emperor standing in front of all of us. <laughs> yeah. And it's really gross. So, But we need to get more people to see that. And when we do, then we actually have a lot of good science based on complexity theory and evolutionary theory to formulate good policies. But we've got to have that paradigm change, and that's what's at play at the moment. That paradigm being, explain what, what you mean by that particular paradigm. So and, the, the, and also why the emperor is grotesque. Yeah, explain that to you. So, so, what, what, so the paradigm we are living in now is the idea that I'll get mine as an individual. And that is the paradigm you're kind of talking about change. Well, it comes in layers. And one, one, one issue, which is that these layers are not connected to each other. On the one hand, you have this body of economic theory, which seems so authoritative because it's so, can I swear on this show? Of course you can. Yes. It's so fucking mathematical that nobody can understand it. Mm. And so they think that that means that there must be something um, right about it. And then there's a narrative which is kind of like the Ayn Rand narrative, which actually isn't connected deeply to the to the uh, uh, mathematical narrative at all. But the whole thing uh, seems to lead to the conclusion that uh, individuals doing what they want is good for the society. There's a basically. virtue to selfishness. That basically it's the greed is good yeah. mentality. And and then a professional economist will say, no, no, we don't, we we're not that dumb. But the fact is, is that the whole body of what they do actually leads to such things as the as the uh, policies of uh, of uh, deregulation. Basically, all regulations are bad. Government is just bad, bad, bad. Regulations are just bad, bad, bad. Just cut people loose, and that's what'll that's what'll work. And that's a precisely what what is part of the uh, problem. We must be smarter than that. But when you do get smarter than that, then what you find out is that actually it's pretty complicated. Uh, there's all kinds of things that are self-organizing. Markets are great as long as they're refereed, for heaven's sakes, and so on and so forth. So, so uh, there's a, um, a new sort of um, uh, uh, framework for, for developing intelligent policies, but uh, it really has to move on to center, center uh, stage. And uh, as long as the the current uh, paradigm uh, remains standing, and it really is a cage fight, uh, I think, and it's not based on like evidential basis. It's based on such things as power, mm. Uh, mm. and so such things as what's happening in Greece and and uh, and in Europe. There's plenty of articulate voices uh, like Thomas Piketty and and uh, Paul Krugman. They're saying, "You guys are just being insane," but not enough people are listening. To them. Well, but that's because, I mean, essentially we make most of these decisions based on authority, preconceived notions. Like, no, you know, we don't, I mean, again, because there is so much mathematics, I think a lot of us don't feel qualified to wade in on these dis discussions. Well, uh, but as someone who's, who's a layman, I, I often find myself disagreeing, especially with Paul Krugman. I have not read Piketty's book, but because I also worry that, that when you, you know, Paul Krugman always seems to be calling for a Western European model, or at least he's very, he's always, he's, he could be considered uh, pretty liberal, if the word's fair. Uh, but we, don't, we, don't, we don't have to get into that. What I'm saying is that I worry sometimes that the upside to 
the old paradigm you're talking about, which would be this notion of individualism, I'm going to get mine, that does lead to a great deal of innovation, doesn't it? Uh, th isn't that the worry that if we get too egalitarian, the argument would be that human beings are naturally selfish and that when people are trying to make a name for themselves, etc., and follow these sort of uh, primal impulses that may be somewhat base, we do get things like, you know, incredible innovation. That's why we lead the world in innovation. I can just see people making that argument, at least, David. Yeah, well, we, um, uh, there is, uh, sorry for pausing. There's so much to. Uh, there's so much to well, say. Well, I'm so smart, but you keep know? going. <laughs> I, I, st I stumped the poor man. I stumped. Well, the you've professor. told me. Uh, you've told me in previous conversations that uh, uh, celebrities have one hang-up. They think they're dumb. They've, they've achieved so much, but they're really worried about their intelligence. Yeah, well, that would be me. That's so, me. Uh, That's me. Yeah. <laughs> But I didn't. I didn't say that Paul Krugman gets everything right, and he actually doesn't take much of an evolutionary perspective. He's mm. he's basically a Keynesian as opposed to right. Um, so uh, so uh, that's not. Uh, I wasn't endorsing everything that uh, everything that um, sure. that he um, that he um, uh, says. And as for entrepreneurship, yes, I mean basically, uh, self interest is a huge motivator. Also, the such things as a reputation and basically just wanting to do well by others is a huge um, motivator, uh, innovation, entrepreneurship. That's basically cultural evolution. Mm. And and so when you take a cultural evolutionary perspective, by all means, uh, societies need to uh, need to change, and that's very much a matter of letting a thousand flowers bloom, letting you know many experiments, basically mm. evaluating those experiments. We want success to be rewarding. We want all of those things. But these are very, you know, to actually shepherd the evolutionary process is requires a lot of structure. To have an entrepreneurship system, an entrepreneurial system that works, it's not just a matter of letting anything go. It's a matter of actually staging an organized competition. And uh, the idea that the private sector is good at entrepreneurship and the state is lousy, it's just flat out false. There's no evidence for that. Really? I would, I, would, I would make that argument. Uh, talk me out of it. I will actually, let me, I'm, 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 uh, I need to get the name, but uh, another, someone else to invite on your show. I will get the name as I am, uh, as I am uh, uh, talking, but she's, she's an Italian economist who's just tearing up the airwaves on, um, on this topic. Hmm. Uh, you can take any innovation, a technological innovation or a, energy, medical, no matter what, and actually look at the history of its development, and you will see that the state has been fundamentally involved in shaping markets. So the idea that the state should only correct markets and not shape them, it's just plain dumb. <laughs> and it never happened. Oh, so, and make, because when when you're just relying on venture, ca their window of time is just way, way too short. And you look at what or, tech startups are generally investing in. Like, there's a lot of talk now about the fact that they invest in you know these sort of stupid like apps that are very sort of incremental. And like Peter Thiel, for example, has been very disappointed that there hasn't been much more fundamental, basic. Like, they're not investing. Like, actually, one of my roommates from college is a venture capital. They're not investing in stuff that's going to pay off in a huge way in 20 years. No, they're investing in user-friendly kind of gadgets. But and gadgets things, yeah. that are like so small Well, whatever the marketplace wants. Yeah. yeah, but the point is is that exactly what David's saying is the fundamental research that all of that stuff draws on was done by places like DARPA, which is government funded, right? The defense advance. Yeah, basically you're telling the story just fine. Yeah. And, and, uh, and so, and then the countries that are really thriving are the ones that have a nice cooperative relationship between the state and the um, and the private sector because the and state it, has the means you're saying because because the state is able to fund these or give grants and because the state is able to look long term and mm -hmm. it has the long term interest it's just not out to make a buck over the short over the short term it has or should um, have the welfare of the society in mind so it can take a long view basically it says we need to develop the you know non renewable uh, the, the renewable energy sector, and that it might take uh, 20 years to to uh, to do so. And one of the points that she makes, this nameless person that I'm not finding, and I'm very embarrassed because she's very famous, is that uh, is that uh, if you really want to fund this in an entrepreneurial way, 
then let the government share the profits. What's happening is, is that the government has invested in all of this stuff, and then companies like Google and Apple, they, they, they rake in the money, and, of course, they avoid paying their taxes. Let's actually make it more of an investment model in which a share of the profits go back to the uh, government as it as it should. So they, as, get, they get some money for it. Yeah, they get some money for it. And as it does do any private uh, investor. Well, they did. We saw that. We saw them do that with the banking industry when it was about to fail, right? We saw the government invest in the banking industry, uh, bail them out, and actually they got a good deal. They got their money back and they made a lot of money on it. So That's right. Yeah. But I think also more generally, like even bef- before we even start looking at the ways in which government funds primary research, the government creates that playing field by creating, you know, mechanisms of trust, by creating law enforcement. I mean, you know, the the there's that great example in Republic Lost by Lawrence Lessig, where he makes the point of just how insane it is that in the United States, you can walk into a car rental place, hand over a piece of plastic to a person you've never seen before, and walk out with a car, mm. right? And that's that's because of large that's because of the system and the infrastructure that the government and the culture provide which goes back to, to why nations fail the institutions yeah. in this country mean a lot um, yeah that's right I mean yeah, yeah you're so you're telling us very commonsensical um, but if when you pursue it and when you try to to uh, provide a strong theoretical foundation for it then you come to some you know very basic theoretical building blocks one of which is just the evolutionary dynamics of cooperation. Just like those water strouders, take any social situation at scale, small or large, and you will find this basic dilemma that the within-group processes are weighing in favor of undermining strategies, basically self-serving, undermining strategies, and that in order to, uh, to create societies that work, groups that work at all scale, from a family to a nation, then there has to be some process of system level selection. You have to be selecting the systems that work compared to the systems that don't work. The forces that are operating within the system are not going to do that for you. That is the opposite of the invisible hand. The invisible hand actually does have a legitimate formulation, and I've written on this um, um, in the academic a literature, but it's not the formulation that everyone knows. And so these are very simple ideas. We're talking about them right now, but they need to move on to center stage. And that is, you know, maybe happening, but it can't happen fast enough. That's one reason why I'm you know, eager to be on a show like this, because this might be a means, a vehicle, basically, for just know, getting the word out there. Mm. Well, and I think to, you know, go back to why the emperor is grotesque, right? I mean, essentially what the, where this argument breaks down is, is that yes, humans pursue their self-interests. That's absolutely true, right? And we're driven by vanity. We're driven by the desire to acquire mates. We're dr- driven by a whole bunch of those desires. But that's not the totality of human uh, existence or human nature or human drives. And when you build a system that acts as if that's all human beings are, then you end up with a system that is distorted and grotesque. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, I think that's quite uh, that's mm. quite fair. Yeah, but I got the, I got my person here. It is Mariana Mazzicato. Many of your readers probably already know about her because it's she pronounced is Mariana Mazzicato. Well, there you go. There you <laughs> yeah. go. Come on, Dave. Come on, Professor. Brian's Let's go. fake Sicilian Mariana. and where he doesn't come from. <laughs> that's right. Mariana but Mazzicato. she is great. She's all over the internet. She's given TED Talks and so on. Mariano Mazzicato. How is that? Mariano Mazzicato. You're getting close. You're getting close. But notice how I roll the R. It's a subtle I'll, thing. We'll, I'll practice. You'll I'll take practice. you'll take my workshop. Oh, Brian, you're gonna <laughs> you, you you're make, gonna love Mariana Mazzicato, by the way. She's probably beautiful. Yeah. yeah. She's tall, she's Italian. What's not to love? All right. But please, uh, please invite her on. She's articulate. She's got everything, and and uh, and she has, you know, she, and including just the, you know, the information um, uh, behind her. This is not like, you know, should not be controversial based on what we know. Based on what we know, we are just deceiving ourselves. And you've actually said that in the past conversations. I might actually like to turn the tables <laughs> because I know that. No, I'm, I'm I'm serious here because you know we talk a lot about how we can take this information that I write about well and does altruism exist, but you know, in an academic way, um, and how can we get this so that it really becomes the part of the vernacular, this becomes part of the common uh, 
sense. And I know that you feel that deeply. Mm-hmm. And, and it comes out better in your own words. So why don't you just channel what I just said? as Because you've got enough about what's, what's in the, you know, folks like me are up to. Right. And you know that there is some kind of barrier that's preventing the rest of the world from knowing it. It's not that it's so very complex. It's not that it can't be, like, you know, as simple as the way we think now. So well, it's, 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 it will be, be, be well because I think that people immediately get into the notion they they are there. There's an ideology, and what people worry about, and I really think that people equate altruism, and especially if you start speaking of altruism within a society, they are reminded of a no, the notion of a commune, the notion of a collective. And all of a sudden, people go, wait a minute, man, this sounds like it's not only contrary to human nature, but it sounds a lot like socialism, et cetera, et cetera. And, and what, I, what I appreciate about your book and your work is that it's, it circumvents all that dialogue and all that debate. And what you're saying is, hold on, guys, I can show you a lot of examples, not only in nature, with insects, etc., um, <clears throat> uh, but, but that, that that altruism, that cooperation, that self-sacrifice within a group is better for the the um, the the species as a whole. You'll produce more offspring. Uh, <clears throat> you'll become more powerful. But you even use the example of how our cells interact in our own body as a form of collective altruism in a way. I mean, maybe I'm, maybe I'm, maybe I'm. No, that's I'm, right, and that's part of what's what's being revived here is the idea of society as an organism, and I mean, this really plays off what you just said, and how that is on the one hand alluring. We love some of the time, some of us, some of the time, love the idea of being part of something larger than ourselves. Yes. Uh, and we, you know, when we get that in a number of ways, including sports events and the, and the like, when we merge into this mass, and this happens in wartime, mm-hmm. uh, many, many accounts of soldiers about how they have just willing to die because they have become part of something larger yes. than themselves. This is a normal state of the human mind. But you just flip it, and then it becomes socialism and communism, all these horrible, horrible, threatening uh, things which have been made fearful, by the way, by opposing ideologies. So we have this ideological minefield that we need to do something. Well, you're kind of doing about. it though, because what you're doing is you're proving, you know, with with examples that that occur in nature, you're proving that there is that somehow and it, the- it's it's evolutionarily um, from an evolutionary point of view, it is advantageous to behave. In an altruistic way, somebody said one time, David Robinson, who is a uh, Dan Robinson, who's a professor uh, at Oxford in philosophy, said he Freud said man goes to war because they hate each other, and he said he missed the mark. Men go to war over love. Uh, they, they, uh, you know, you, the best soldier is one who's defending his way of life, defending uh, uh, slogans, defending uh, a philosophy, an and ideology, ultimately and ultimately his an brothers idea. in arms, and his brothers in yep. arms. Yep. Uh, that's where the sacrifice comes from, and and people have argued that that makes that makes the best soldier when people believe they're on the side of justice. And so we can think of a book such as mine and many other books uh, in the same genre as a kind of a stepping stone. But then, what's the next? Step, and that's we. I mean, we talk about EvoCon. I'd actually like. I'd like actually you to talk. You to tell your audience. Yeah. About EvoCon and what it represents in terms of the next step. My my book being a stepping stone towards something else, which is much more accessible. Anyone can wrap their. Head well, that's around. that's that we always talk about. This podcast is is always the idea that great ideas are stuck in books. And, and people like yourself, Professor David Sloan Wilson, who writes a book like Does Altruism Exist and a number of other things, th- there are some incredible ideas that could really change the way we think and act. Unfortunately, most people are busy. Um, most people don't even know that these books and these ideas are out there because they're living their lives and for a thousand other reasons. And... Let's just take the notion of evolution. Evolution is a charged word, man. It's, I think, something like 40% of Americans don't even believe it. It's, it's, a, it's a viable theory. Um, and EvoCon, 
would be a convention on evolution with some of the brightest minds in the field, like yourself, hopefully like Steven Pinker, etc., evolutionary biologists and things like that, who would get together and there's, there's the, the challenge is, sure, we could have a convention with a lot of academics that get together and talk about how true evolution is and talk about all the proofs. We need a bridge. We need to get those great ideas, the ideas that you you come up with, that you grapple with in these books. We need to get those ideas out to the general public. We've got to start changing minds, hearts and minds, because it's important, because not believing in science, not believing in evolution is ignorance is not bliss in this case it is in many ways detrimental for a thousand reasons and somebody needs to be the bridge we've got to figure out a way to create a convention that people want to be a part of at least want to watch and listen to and be astonished by and have their minds blown and have their minds changed and have their minds get excited we we want to we want to make these kinds of things because every time i talk to somebody like you it, it i just i was just thinking as you were speaking i was just thinking about how privileged i feel i just love being here because i love listening to this because i love having my mind changed you know here you are talking about how the idea behind the fact that the state isn't involved in uh innovation is ridiculous i you just changed my mind I didn't know that. I had very strong points of view on that. And I hear you give me some examples and all of a sudden I'm like, hey, man, I just I just learned something here. And I think that people out there, most people are very open to having their minds changed. It's a question of how we do that. It's a question of how we approach it. And EvoCon, which is, I think, your brainchild and some other people's brainchild, the idea that we're, let's, let's create a convention. Let's, cr let's start with, let's gather the best minds, let's gather our forces together, and then try to figure out how to get this, this incredible idea. It's, it's, the evolution is about as much a theory as atomic theory is, by the way, and the theory of gravity. Um, let's, let's, let's try to figure out how we change people's minds and how we get them to come over. And this, this is where, uh, this is where entertainers come in. Yep. Yep. That's what does that mean? It's not entertainers don't just do fluffy stuff. I mean, entertainment, entertainment, artists and the like is a vehicle for communicating some of the most profound ideas that are, uh, that are out there, but in a way that captivates us. Of course, that we don't have that doesn't require our willpower. That uh, that basically that just that just uh, engrosses us. That's the stepping stone. Entertainment basically. entertainment taps into emotion. Uh, my teacher, my acting teacher, used to look at us and say, "Art disturbs people. It <laughs> disturbs, and it's supposed to. It makes you laugh and it makes you cry. And when you laugh and you cry, a lot of some pretty crazy things start to happen." It's really hard to let go of my father's teaching, which is what I find even at 48 years old, I have to do all the time. And when you said that the state has a role in innovation, I immediately, I, I almost started to try to defend my father. That's what I just did. And a lot of people fall into these camps. And I had an emotional reaction that I had to stop myself because I'm older now. And I had to just listen to David Sloan Wilson and, and make I, I mean, argument. of course, uh, it's wonderful to find someone that's open-minded like you, but I think you're right that we're all open-minded in a sense when we're approached in the right, in the right way. Exactly. And, and uh, i got to tell you a story. It's actually something I tweeted about, but uh, um, I came across this item in which uh, uh, some Chinese subversives, they t uh, the, with all the pollution that's taking place there, they actually took the smoke that's belching from the smokestacks there, and they used it as a screen, and they projected the image of a crying baby, a baby just, you know, in wow. great distress, crying. They projected it on the smoke in the evening, Wow! belching from the smokestack, and it was so horrifying to make that connection, that emotional connection, that it spoke more than a million words, not just a thousand words. Say what you like about pollution and so on. This image of a crying baby projected against the smokestack they made it shameful. Mm. And I think, to me, that just summarizes the power of art to do something that, uh, that intellectual arguments uh, can't do. We need, we need them both. 
And well, I, and you I could th- look what Uncle Tom's Cabin did, right? Wasn't it? Wasn't it Lincoln who said? No, that's You're- known basically, yeah. basically by humanizing the slain. That work of fiction, yeah. uh, I think it's it's really known. It's a fact in a sense that that work of fiction was uh, was uh, really. Uh, as potent as anything else that happened to uh yeah lincoln said you're the small wo- you're the little woman that wrote that 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 little book that caused this great war or something yeah, like that yeah that's it's right kinda... and they said and that's true and that's why we get these flips basically these these moral flips as we've seen so interesting that we think the world is trending in a conservative direction and then we get these these trends in the in the progressive uh direction that just happen because something some flip takes place and just the way we regard humanity and, and our moral, our moral sentiments get realigned. Mm. It's uh, so interesting, and it's all happening right now. I mean, this is a very formative time in, in, uh, in history. This is a time where things can change, and that makes it just especially important to accomplish the intellectual change. The resources are there, but uh, but that doesn't mean that the that the uh, you know the failed paradigms are going to go lightly into the night. That's not what happens. Well, I think that when you speak about evolution, religious people will tend to, and if you think about Evocon, I think religious people will immediately view that in emotionally as a threat to the thing that they draw inspiration from and comfort from and meaning from, which is their idea of what religion means to them, whatever their religion is. But I think, and that's... I think the idea is to make sure that we we that, that there's a way again to circumvent that. It doesn't mean you you can't have your personal God. It doesn't mean you shouldn't go to church or whatever it is that brings you inspiration and comfort and meaning. Uh, it, this is this is this seem this should be able to stand on its own uh, merit, and it's just you know that's that's kind of what I think is so potent about your work is that you're using nature and you're using science as an example of how altruistic behavior without the help of sort of this sky god looking down on you who will punish you if you don't behave a certain way. Altruistic behavior is ultimately the best way to go. And you use science to prove that. So, Hunter, did you... Uh, yeah, to- well, I think, you know, to, to Brian's point about uh, religion, I mean, I think the part of that, that defensiveness is totally justified. I mean, you have Richard Dawkins, you hear the way that a guy like that talks about religion. As a religious person, I would feel threatened. He essentially is making the case that religion has no function, no purpose, that it's a virus, that it's all these sorts of things. And I think that's why, you know, in terms of speaking about bridges, I think that's why the work of people like David Sloan Wilson and Jonathan Haidt can be so productive is because it's a very different conception of religion that you're offering because you're saying that religion and altruism and all these other behaviors are pro-social. They, they are evolutionary adap- evolutionarily adaptive. Yes, they can create problems, but they have a function and we have to use, learn how to harness them effectively. Right. And so, you know, there's a lot to say about that. Let me knock off just, uh, just a few. It's true that the, uh, my work and uh, Jonathan's work and, and others work, in fact, a large body of work, is approaching religion from a purely scientific perspective. That is, strangely enough, in some ways, friendly to religion, because what it says is is that a good religion provides a meaning system that creates wonderful uh, communities. So that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is that, uh, of course, there's the dark side to religion, many dark sides to religion, including to many bright sides, and also that uh, we are studying religion as a purely human construction. And so the forms of religion that really require a belief in a, in a God, you know, are threatened by our perspective. I wouldn't want to say um, otherwise. I had a wonderful encounter with a woman, a black woman in Memphis. That was, I was in an inner city neighborhood, and I, I was saying something about a belief in in God, and this woman goes up to her full height <laughs> and girth, <laughs> and she said, <laughs> "She said, I don't believe in God. I have a relationship with God." And this person, wow. you know, what sustained her was really a relationship with a person that was tremendously important to her. And in the first place, I respect that, 
And in the second place, though, I think that, frankly, the way I think about it, it threatens that. And we just have to acknowledge that the tension is still there. But nevertheless, there's many varieties of religion that are very, very compatible with, uh, with evolution. And the Pope's encyclical, uh, still fresh in the news, is an amazing example of that because the Pope uh, just got so much of the science right and was unthreatened by that science. That was amazing. And the other thing that... I don't know much about that, David. Can you just dial it on a little bit? Well, the whole scientific world was amazed. I have a... I I, uh, sponsored an article for it in This View of Life, my online magazine that I that I manage uh, this view of life. I encourage your readers to uh, uh, to go to it. Uh, but uh, the, I mean, if you if you read the, the the reception to the to the encyclical, I mean, all the kind of the the scientific and the you know the secular press said, "Oh my heavens, this 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 person just nailed the science behind the need for uh, environmentalism." And he just got it, the science, right. Isn't that amazing? But the other thing that he got right was the critique of economics. And he said in his own words that the economic emperor has no clothes and is a huge part of the, huge part of the problem. This is quite apart from his theological argument. I'm actually interested in his theological argument. Back to the study of religion. <laughs> yeah. I'm, going to be, I'm going to be writing an article on the Pope's theological argument. Just why, what, how did he quote the scriptures? And, and in, in addition, so half the time he's quoting the scientific evidence, half the time he's, <laughs> excuse me, a third, a third of the time he's quoting the uh, scientific evidence, a third of the time he's just trashing economics, and in, and a third of the time he's quoting scripture. So how do these things? <laughs> how do these things? <laughs> Complicated go together? guy. Yeah. The scriptural part is something I'm especially interested in because it actually has a lot to say about cultural evolution. That's uh, we'll put that aside for the moment. But what's so fascinating is that really we shouldn't be talking about the, the you know the religious issue, although there are issues, as I have just said. Uh, but if you want to find the element of society that's truly detached from reality, that's truly just out in the ozone, it is not the religious believer. It's just the economist. Back to the back to the emperor with no clothes. The pope nailed that, mm. and we need to nail it too. It's just I mean the the worst form of fundamentalism, just head in the clouds fundamentalism is not the religious believer. It's the economist. <laughs> That's fascinating. Uh, guess who's going to be quoting that and taking it <laughs> as his own? Um, that's, yeah, that's, but, that's kind of really an interesting thing to say and an interesting and, thing to think about. And back to EvoCon, like I should acknowledge, like when we first started about EvoCon, I wasn't totally convinced that we really needed a conference about evolution. I mean, you know, because I think there's such a tendency to think of evolution, and I was guilty of this in terms of Darwin's finches and all of this sort of stuff. And it's like, okay, clearly it's true. Clearly it's a very interesting way to view the world, but does it affect our lives on a daily basis? And what I've really come to realize through doing this podcast, even just our last interview with Jennifer Jacquet. Yep, she's a great person. um, And, you know... beautiful. (laughs) You had to say that. I had to say it. I'm a man. Um, but, But exactly, like, to your point, and you're a man, like... So so much of what this is all really about and why the evolution is so important is because we have these underlying drives and this underlying psychology, which, you know, biology has now come to really understand. And that much more refined model of human nature is essential to creating a better society. You know, we now understand humanity in a way that Adam Smith never could have understood. Like, Mm. Adam Smith came to very sort of basic intuitions about self-interest, which was a really powerful insight in 1776 when he wrote The Wealth of Nations. But, you know, we now have a much, much more refined understanding of human nature, and we should be engaging with that science and then creating a more sophisticated society that produces better outcomes. I mean, for example, one of the things in Does Altruism Exist that I thought was brilliant and amazing was when you they did studies where they take kids who are behaving in a deviant way, and mm-hmm. when you put them together in a 
group, yep. they behave more in a more deviant way. And isn't that something that we've all suspected about prisoners? That if you put people together in a massive facility like a prison, that you're encru- encouraging criminal activity in some sense. Yeah, so that's called deviance training. I'm glad that you picked up upon it. And of course, that's hugely relevant because we're always, I mean, everything we do makes sense to us. So we have some background. It might be a formal theory. It might be a religion. It might be whatever it is. It's some background that makes sense of what we decide to do. But if it's the wrong background, then what it makes sense of can actually be insane and counterproductive. And prison policy is one of those things. Also, many well-meaning uh, intervention policies where you take troubled kids, basically, at-risk kids, as we like to uh, uh, talk about them. We bring them together. We try to counsel them. But they really feed much more off each other than off what the adults are, are saying. And you've made the problem um, worse. So so uh, this is why just, you know, the right background is required to do the things that actually work. And what we need to do is we need to make evolution the right background, evolution slash complexity, basically scientific knowledge, uh, and, and then, you know, all roads lead to evolution when we, when we talk about um, evolution and complexity, when we talk about scientific knowledge. This is why the theory change, the idea change, is really the essential prerequisite for the practice change. If we don't do that, then, you know, we might happen upon things. We might develop local theories that work. You know, it's not as if nothing works, Mm. but we need the idea change before we can get the action change. And that's why for the people that do that, and many have, again, the idea that this is so terribly complex or kind of intuitive and stuff that like, you know, humans can't wrap their heads around it, that's stupid in in my opinion. I know many, many hundreds of people have done this on the basis of reading a single book or taking a single class. I get it now, and then they're on their way. Mm. So it's not as if it can't be done on a wholesale basis, but it has not yet been done on a wholesale basis, and that brings us back to that next step. How do we go beyond the sort of the level of the of the books like myself and Jonathan Haidt, of, of which there are many, Jacqueline's the person you just um um, uh, interviewed, you know, we're doing a good job at that intermediate level, but there's the next step of reaching everybody, and it's there that music and art and movies and 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 books that reach mass audience slogans, um, memes of all sorts, is what actually causes this to be part of the fabric of everyday life. And so that, I think, is the great challenge. And EvoCon sort of represents that. EvoCon's not going to do that all by itself, but it's basically the concept that you can take these ideas, which are so potent and so, you know, ready to be uh, dispersed, and we could actually do that in a way that is just plain fun, like going to a movie or going to a show. It just ropes us in and that's what the next step is. That's and that is what, by the way, Brian, you did really well today. Because uh, what this all comes down to, and this is what I'm really realizing in this conversation, is the whole last year of doing this podcast has really been about being honest about human nature. Mm. Being honest about who we are, right? Yeah. And in terms of, like, you know, the our, our conversation with Jennifer... Right. You know, you you were really being honest about like (laughs) what our drives were that we were trying to show off, you know, calling us out, you know, trying to impress her. And I think that's the thing is is that what we really need for EvoCon is to, you know, playfully draw out for people. This is who we are. Yes. When a terrorist attacks us, naturally, we want to go and try and kill them all. But guess what? That's not a very effective strategy. Right. Mm. Um, Or, you know, naturally. You know, when, you know, somebody commits a crime, we want to, like, you know, hide them away, put them together in a box far, far away from society. But guess what? Or just punish them. Or just punish them, them. yeah. Kill them or torment them, basically. Yeah. Yeah. But guess what? When you lock all those people in a box together, they feed off of each other and end up learning criminal behavior <laughs> so that then you've like concentrated that. And then when, you know, they come back into the population, well, guess what? That's what they've really learned. 
Um, so if you, got, if you want to solve the problem, you've got to know, you've got to, you've got to keep f- searching for how, what really makes us tick, what really makes yeah. us work, what and, works and what doesn't. And that's fundamentally yeah. the question that you have to, I think that the, the, the power of the evolution a- aspect is, is that, you know, wh- it's, it's how quickly do you go from looking at the problem to looking back at yourself, trying to understand your own nature, trying to understand human nature as a way to try and design a better system? Because the problem is, is that, you know, right now our minds go raging around and around and around and we don't look back at our own biology. And it, beca- and it, can, beca- and it can be the greatest story ever told, basically. This can be like as engrossing as anything can be. It's just like you want to think about nothing else once you catch on, basically. A hundred percent. I mean, it's like reading Jerry, Co- Jerry Coyne's book, uh, Why Evolution is True. I realized that my belief in evolution just had to do with the fact that I just trusted the scientists and didn't trust those other guys. And I was, on, I was in this camp because it was how I was raised. And I knew a little bit about Darwin. But when I read that book... Oh my God! Oh my God! The evidence is overwhelming, which is why everybody who we have, every scientist we have on this podcast, almost every, regardless whoever they are, an academic, all talk about evolution, and it's a huge part of the conversation uh, that they draw on. So, and I can't, I can't help observing that. Uh, so, so glad that you, you know, basically that Jerry Coyne's book was so influential. Uh, to you, but do you know that <laughs> you do know that Jerry Coyne and Steve Pinker and I, you know, we quarrel with each other. Do you really? Uh, oh, totally. Oh, I love it. Wait. Well, it's on, you know, it's on group selection, basically. It's a big dividing line. Really? I love big, that. Big dividing line. Uh, I was going to ask you about whether or not you've had arguments with people like Richard Dawkins or, or, or these guys. So, so, so there is a big dividing line. This is what's beautiful about thought and, 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 th- science. and science is that well, it's one constant things, rebuttal. One of the things it reveals, one of the, and I think it's important to say this, is that you know, science is not free of ideology. Mm. And it's not free of cultural influence. So when you look back at Darwin's day, you find that, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the theory of evolution was emerging, but it was terribly distorted by Victorian culture. And so everyone, uh, Darwin plus all of his uh, associates back then, had certain biases that really prevented them from seeing lots of stuff. I mean, it went without saying for Darwin that men were superior to women, that that uh, that uh, some cultures were superior to others. Uh, there was no way that you could escape from thinking these things um, uh, if you were rooted in that uh, uh, that uh, that uh, culture. And scientists are people. Yeah. And so. Yep. That's right. We have, we're committed to certain ideas too. And and when we when we fall on different sides of some big ideological divide, and group selection is one of those. Uh, you know, some people really just resonate to that. Uh, individualistic notion they love thinking the idea that everything's selfish and that's basically led to the concept of selfish genes other people are are repelled by that they want to think that uh, nature is fundamentally cooperative that goes all the way back to you know peter kropotkin the russian anarchist uh, um, um, way back so you know we're so science has to contend with many many well as as a man who's read pinker coin (laughs) Wilson, <laughs> let me put the debate to rest. Your book, it Does Altruism Exist?, does a pretty amazing job of swaying the layman's mind, the celebrity mind, if you will, <laughs> over to the uh, Professor David Sloan Wilson camp. So take so, that, Jerry and Steve. That's take all. that, oh, Jerry bam. and Steve. I got you on that. I'm the final say, and this has been the Brian Callen slash Hunter Mott Show. Uh, and thanks for listening. David Sloan Wilson, obviously, welcome back anytime. And you and I are going to be speaking more via Skype. I hope so I can see your um, sexy, white, flabby, as you call it. But I didn't see any flab. I just saw a big brain and glasses. But anyway, I look forward to speaking to you. And let's get this EvoCon thing off the ground. I'm talking to some people who can help us with that. And we'll, we'll talk more about that. But uh, you're awesome. Thank you for your work. Thank you for... Um, everything you do and uh keep fighting the good fight we'll talk to you very soon likewise awesome stuff david sloan wilson and also by the way if anybody's listening out there you know tweet at us if you have things that you would like to see addressed in evocon we've been talking about you know dealing with everything from racism to you know gender to you know economics obviously to education like if there are any topics you really want to see covered like let us know yep Thank you, Professor. All righty. You're the best. 
Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Awesome stuff, kids. That's it for us. Hope everybody learned everything. Go to go to tfatk.com, T-F-A- uh, TK, the fighter and the kid.com for my schedule or Brian for my schedule of where I'm doing stand up. By the time you hear this, I'll be in Dallas. I'll be in Denver, then Dallas at the end of the month at Addison, the Addison Improv. Yeah. You've been listening to The Brian Callen Show with Brian Callen. Be sure to like him on Facebook. Just search for Brian Callen Comedy and follow him on Twitter. Just search for at Brian Callen. You can also find him online by visiting his website. Just go to briancallen.com. Until next time, bye-bye.